Hello and welcome to Acme's YouTube channel. My name is Kate Fagay and today I'm so excited to be talking to Neil Huxley from his home in LA. Neil is a director who's mastered the fine art of blending visual effects and live action so that his audiences are able to be fully immersed into the dark and enchanting worlds that he's created. Neil's work traverses massive titles like Avatar, Watchmen, Mad Max, Transformers and of course today we'll be talking to him about his interactive game trailer Middle Earth Shadow of War. The shadow of war spreads across Mordor. As an army of orcs amass under the rule of man. Choices you'll make. Master, don't leave me here. Face me, talk. Because nothing will be forgotten. It's great to talk to you. Thanks for being with us. Um, look, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, this amazing interactive game trailer for Endor Foe Shadow of War uh, that you directed. Well, first of all, can you tell me what an interactive movie is? Well, an interactive movie is a sequence of, well, in this case, a sequence of live action vignettes that are strung together with choice points, okay? I think they did it on Netflix recently with a Black Mirror episode that was quite similar to what we did for Shadow. Um, and the interactive movie is supposed to mirror somewhat the choices that you have in the game. So for this particular game, where you are building relationships with orcs, whether they're your friends or your foes, that's that was the idea: is to at least show that in a in an in a, in a commercial context that would get gamers excited um, and uh, and show them what it might be like to play the game. How important was your knowledge of the game in directing this bot? I think I think it's important in any. In any, in any commercial or any video game piece of marketing, you know, uh, any marketing asset that's to do with video games, if I'm being employed to make a cinematic commercial, whatever it may be, some understanding of that game, I think, and games in general is important because I think you see, you, you see the result when teams aren't, perhaps fans of the games that they're making trailers for. You, know, you, you can see it all over YouTube. Gamers are some of the most vicious critics that exist out there. They will let you know if they're not happy about something, you know, if a trailer doesn't speak to them or if they feel like it's rubbish, you know, like they will call it out. So... I think it's important to understand as being a gamer myself, I know, I know what I want to see in a trailer. You know, I know what I, and it's, it's my job to sell the sizzle, not the steak. Okay. I think deli the, delivering the promise of a great game is, is my job. And then actually delivering the game itself is the developer's job, right? Sometimes you'll see a great, amazing trailer. I mean, it happens in movies all the time. You'll watch the trailer and you'll think, my God, this film looks awesome. And then you go see it and you're like, wow, 
they literally lifted all the best bits of this film and put it in a trailer. Hmm. You know, the, the film is a little, little, little bit underwhelming, you know, um, same happens in games, you know? So I think it's important as a, as you know, as a director working in the game space to know that, um, that your knowledge of games helps you and, and that you, you are, you are there to excite the gamers, you know? So I think it's, I think having knowledge is important. There's different types of game trailers. There's the in-engine trailer, which is different to your interactive movie. Can you just tell us a little bit, um, I guess, about the different types of trailers? Sure, sure. So, so you've got in-engine gameplay trailers, which fans always want to see because it's the game. You know, this is what they're going to be spending money on. They want to see graphics. They want to see gameplay. But usually these games don't get finished until two weeks out from release date. Sometimes they'll fast track certain sequences of the game so that they can cut gameplay trailer. Usually even gameplay trailers will have some kind of VFX touch up, whether it be compositing or some kind of, we call it gameplay plus, right? Which is you get gameplay footage from the, from the developer and it's your job to make it look sexy in some way. Okay. So, they usually come right on the release of the game. But how do you get gamers excited pre-release or, you know, six months out? And that's usually when pre-rendered or live action trailers come into play because they've got no gameplay that's worth showing. It's just not ready. So what we do then is we usually get game assets from the developer and we'll do a pre-rendered uh, piece, you know, using 3D programs like Maya or Max or whatever, whatever you want to use to create a pre-rendered piece, which again, developers will want it to look like their game, but I always want to try and push it more into a zone of, of perhaps, you know, plus, plusing it up, getting people more excited. You know, it's like, again, I'm, 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 well, we work in advertising. You know, so you're, you're there to sell a product. Since when has it really been truthful? <laughs> you know, <laughs> True. So kind of know what your audience is. As a developer, you always want to hook in an audience that doesn't know your game or doesn't play games. And I think that's where a live action trailer really does come into play because it, it does, it, it, it inspires and excites. And like I say, you create a world that people feel they can step into which was what we did for Shadow of War. Shadow of War is built on a relationship between you, the player, and the orcs that you're going to uh, either have as allies or have as enemies. And whether those orcs are allies and loyal or enemies that will betray you depends on your actions in the game, how you treat them in the game. So what the team wanted to do here was create an experience that put the player into the moment of making that choice and then suffer the consequences of that decision. It was my, my mantra from the beginning, which I would you know, constantly say to every department that was on the job was, this can't look like cosplay. This can't look any less good. <laughs> yeah, and this can't look any less good than, than what Peter Jackson's done. I mean, this is Lord of the Rings. We're gonna get laughed at, you know? Mm. Like, and that, I'm not doing that. So we've got the budget to be able to do this. So, you know, my, my intent, I always would show everyone Fellowship of the Ring. That's like, to me, that's still one of the best looking of, of all of those movies because Peter did a lot of that stuff in camera. And all of those orcs are scary because mm. they're seven foot Kiwis in mm. full makeup, you know, like they're real. Mm. There's a reason why those orcs are scary. It's because they're real. Um, and I think when you're dealing with CG characters or CG monsters that are supposed to be threatening, if I can tell that it's not real, it doesn't scare me, you know? Okay. And I think that was important for this game because, you know, to go back to what the game was about, which is about making relationships with these orcs and connecting with them, that's why I chose practical effects. It's because, you know, 
humanoid characters with prosthetics are going to be better for the audience to connect with rather than a CG orc, you know? How did that impact your casting? When you were um, looking at actors, like you were saying, the New Zealand uh, Maoris are huge. Um, you have already had a character who was from the game and, uh, you, you know, he was going to be appearing live action. So how did you make that work? What sort of considerations did you make with the casting? So we were going to cast in London because we knew we were going to shoot in Europe, right? So, you know, you're working with local, you're already working with local talent there, right? So I was going to be taking over principal cast, which I think was Talion, which was the lead, the lead uh, ranger. And then we decided on five hero orcs that were going to get the full prosthetic love. Um, and then there were going to be seven stuntmen that were going to have really good zip-up masks that looked good close to camera. Everyone else was wearing sprayed-up Halloween masks. <laughs> and, and that when you're on set, that's when you really, like, some really nerve-wracking stuff because you're looking at these people and I'm like, they look terrible. I mean, they look really bad. So what do I do? Okay, let's bring that flame bar forwards and let's put those extras behind the flame bar where I can see them but it's all through heat shimmer yeah. and you're just getting texture of guys hitting each other yeah. let's bring the good looking guys close to camera and that was that was really the, the the dance that you're constantly doing is like looking at your monitor making sure everyone looks good um so so to get back to your question about casting that was, that was really the approach I had. And, and the casting experience in London was hilarious. Talion, I, we, it was, uh, luckily Nick McKinless, who was my stunt coordinator, who's a really, really good friend of mine, incredibly experienced stuntman um, and action director. He knew of a couple of guys that could play Talion. Like, and I'm talking, I didn't want to cut from a stunt actor to a, to a, uh, 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 an actor, right? I wanted, I wanted Talion to be a stunt actor that we that would deliver the lines that. So then I wouldn't have to cut. It's the one thing I I always notice in fight sequences is stunt guy, stunt guy is always shot from behind and he's wearing a bad wig, <laughs> and then you cut, you cut to close up of your main talent, you know, and it's all you can always tell. I didn't want to do that. I almost wanted to shoot this like a game sequence in some ways in that you're watching this guy pull these moves off and it's the same guy that's delivering all the lines. You know, like this is... And that's what we ended up finding, a guy called um, Ashley Beck who turned up with a samurai sword and just went to town in front. We're all sitting on casting couches looking at this guy to <laughs> like do these flips and, you know, like with this sword and it's like, okay, he's got the job, you know. And he looked uh, like the character. And well, yeah, I mean, he did, he had short hair, but we, we, you know, we got a really good um, wig maker in who created, she created this wig out of real hair. And I swear she put it on him and he looked like, he looked like um, Aragon out of Lord, like, you know, out of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I mean, it, it really did work well. Casting for the Orcs was just like, I mean, I was, we were getting guys coming in just, I mean, it was like, here's a, here's a plastic axe. Here's some lines, deliver these like, you know, like an awkward, you know, like and all the Orcs in the game are Cockneys, by the way. Yeah. It's, it's hilarious. <laughs> Perfect. I'm not sure why they did it that way. So casting in London was kind of, you know, it kind of made sense. Like Spencer Wilding, um, amazing actor, seven foot kickboxer who had played Darth Vader in Rogue One and had been in um, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. So this guy's got acting, like, real solid acting experience and he's a fighter and he's a mean, he looks, he's, a, he's such a lovely bloke, but he looks like dangerous, right? And he was Noruk. I mean, we knew straight away. It's like this yeah. guy's got a, you know, we found, we found him. When I first saw Charlie in full makeup speaking the lines, it was like, we knew, we found some real gems. 
Allow me um, to sigh. To crush the life out of any stinking scab that dares stand in our path. This might be a nice feature. You know, yeah. if there's like a, 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 one of the choices, it comes out of the dark. Promote me to overlord. And these walls will forever tower over the corpses of our enemies. Or maybe, you know, we can use this. So you shot the whole thing in seven days in the Ukraine? Yeah. Loved this fortress down in Odessa. Of course I did, which was on the shores of the Black Sea, which had frozen over at that mm -hmm. time. But it was a real fortress that we could shoot and then extend in post, you know, like use it as a backdrop, mm -hmm. which again worked so well that these, we had, you know, a real working fortress. The only problem with that then is obviously getting equipment in there and lights and things like that, that, I mean, to get, to get, you know, high powered lights in there was impossible to get a crane, to get a techno crane in some parts of that fortress was impossible. So it really did limit the way I could shoot it. It was really, really cold. We had to bring in the Ukrainian army at one point to shift snow and ice. Wow. And then we got to, we went to Kiev to a stage in Kiev where it was a drainable stage because at this point it starts raining in the film and I wanted rain towers inside the studio, raining on our uh, cast during this whole fight sequence. And, and I also wanted to keep the doors of the stage open. I think everyone hated me a little bit for that because- Why was that? Well, because I wanted to still have the breath you know, we, when, we were down, oh. when we were down in Odessa outdoors, everyone had, we could see the, the, the breath coming out of everyone, you know, the steam coming out of everyone's mm. mouth. I didn't want to do that in post. It's yeah. like, just keep the doors open. Like, and, and everyone just keep jackets on. We had heaters and stuff like that. I don't think, I like I say, I think people were expecting a nice <laughs> couple of days on a warm stage. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that wasn't going to happen. Neil, could you talk a little bit about how you blend the visual effects and the practical uh, live action world together and, and uh, what your process was? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, a lot of that beautiful work was done by MPC in New York. The approach was always to get the practical stuff as close to camera as we could. Okay. So everything within, you know, a, a, a 15, 10, 15 metre radius was going to be practical. Some of the background would be, but it, then we would extend it in CG and we would also add in, you know, the armies and all the creatures. And I just, that was, that really was, again, taking game assets, animating, up resing those, and then basically building up that army in various layers uh, taking the live action backdrop of the fortress and adding in more towers and things like that. So the plan was, and this is the response I get from a lot of people that watch that. They can't tell where practical effects ends and CG starts. That's really Which is what you're that, aiming for. That's what you're aiming for. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's like going back again to what I said about CG characters a CG character close to camera, you can always tell. We're still not, I mean, there's been instances where it's done really well, don't get me wrong, like mm. Caesar in Planet of the Apes. I mean, beautiful mm. work. Mm. Such, but when you're on very a commercial- Very expensive. Yeah, very expensive. We're on a commercial schedule, mm. commercial budget, you know? Mm. So, um, so yeah, it was always the plan was to, was to hide that not know where one ended and one and the, where where one thing ended and the other thing began and to blur those lines mm. was always yeah it was it was um, again you know i'd love to take credit for that but it was that's mpc you know that was that was the great team over there we had great previs we had great storyboards great previs um we had a plan you know and i think that's always really important you know uh, is to have is to prep well. And I have these conversations with people a lot. I'm going through it right now on my own feature, where, you know, I'm being I'm being asked, do you really need previs? 
you know, it's expensive. Like, can't you just go in with some shot notes and some storyboards? And it's like, if I was just doing a drama with no 12 foot robots in it, sure. Mm. But when you're doing something that mm. involves so many moving parts, previs is so important because it's not just for me. I can then show the heads of every department what's in my head, you know, on screen. And I'm not saying anyone has to be beholden to, to the framing and the timing and all that stuff. Mm. That's not what I'm mm. saying. I think it's just good to go through that process so that you can communicate to your team what you're looking for. And I, I've got guys in, in my feature that are going to be puppeteering like, you know, robots, wow. practical yeah. robots. Mm. And for them, I think it's really important for them to see how much of the robot is going to be seen so that they understand, you know, how much of them I'm going to need to paint out and et cetera, et cetera. So would you say it saves money in the long run? I mean, we've talked about how a lot of the time things need to fix it in post, but <laughs> yeah, I always yeah. say this, it's like you either spend the money now, or you're going to spend it later. Take your pick. It was something that MPC and Vicky and her team really were spearheading, you know, because again, looking at the magic, the magic effect in the game, so that your character is possessed by this uh, ancient elven uh, spirit, okay, that um, there's this duality in the game, and we needed to represent that in the in the film, and you know particle effects in game look great but again it's that what does what would this look like in real life you know like if we if Keller Brimble was standing there in front of me what would he look like so it was a process of r and I, I you know I would look at move existing movies and get reference from other films that I'd seen but there there was nothing really that it, you're never going to find something that exactly nails what you're after with an effect like this, it was kind of like showing us because the, the, the spirit has more of a skull face. So it was like showing that it wasn't like an X-ray look. It was something else. It had to be more magical. And it had to feel like when Frodo puts the ring on, there's this, this effect, okay? There's this effect that, that, that is going on that, that changes the visuals, that we kind of wanted to pay homage to. It was kind of this, this um, constant particulate that was coming off of the character, but it didn't need to, it, we didn't want it to look like he was on fire. So it was this kind of, it was a process of trial and error and R and D until, you know, until you see something and you're like, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That looks great. Let, you know, that little bit there, let's explore that some more. And, then you come up with the effect and, and then, yeah, I, I think what they did is take the effect that was that you see in game and they've made a realistic interpretation of that effect. If you're doing something that has extensive VFX in it, I think previs is vital. Mm. But again, knowing that, you know, allowing for happy accidents to happen on set is always important. You know, don't be a slave to it, but use it in the right way. Film directing is triage, right? Stuff will always go wrong. And I think it's about managing the amount of stuff that is going wrong. It's stemming the bleeding, okay? I, 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 there hasn't been a shoot yet that I've done where everything has gone right. It never does. How can it be? You, there's 50 people there, all with personalities and brains, all working independently from you, your job to try and bring everyone together sure but sometimes it just doesn't go according to plan and and sometimes great things come out of that you know um but yeah, yeah. it's it's previs stops that bleeding it's triage it's really good triage you know because you can go right wait everyone over here let's watch the previs on the on the laptop and every, you always you'll get ah oh. You know, because someone didn't quite understand yes. what you were yeah. after. And, yeah. you know, just it really does help. 
So, Neil, given that you're, I guess, you're working with a game that has all of these assets um, that have already been built in Unity um, or, or whatever the game engine is, um, how much do those game assets figure in your process? And did you consider, I guess, using pre-rendered environments like people are with the big LED screens and shooting in that environment? What, what? Yeah, I mean, look, I think back then that type of filmmaking was really... I mean, we're talking, I shot that in 2017. It was still really expensive to do big LED work. Um, especially, I mean, like looking at The Mandalorian, I mean, it's like, that's, again, it's set the bar, isn't it? You know, so you don't want to do anything now that that could perhaps look worse than that. You know, like, I mean, it, it looks so good. So I was asking, how much of the game assets um, from the developer figure into your your process how much start. are they used or not used okay um so the video game assets that we get when we do a job like this factor in quite heavily because it saves us building everything from scratch okay when you've got lots and lots of characters in the game that want to be represented that the developer wants represented on screen i mean we can build them that's just an extra cost so you're always trying to fight costs. You're always trying to keep the numbers down. And what you usually get is an asset dump from the developer. Sometimes those assets are really nicely labeled and organized. Sometimes it's just like, here you go. And you have to rummage through 10 terabytes of stuff to find the stuff that you want. But ultimately, that's what you want. And usually they're very low poly. So you have to up-res them. You have to up-res the textures. Um, but... They, they, they factor heavily. You know, they're very, very important. Um, like I say, just from a cost perspective, because you're always fighting cost. Every job I do is like, they want this and they've got this. You know, how can we make this for that? Mm. And it's like, yeah. okay, well, first thing, let's get an asset dump. Let's see what sort of state these models are in. Let's see how much work we need to do. Sometimes you'll get high-res zebra sculpts because they've really gone to town on their main characters. And it's like, oh, God, yes, please. You know, that's the, that's the stuff we want. You know, we want all of those textures given to us, you know, like facial rigs. A lot of the time we can't use the facial rigs that they're using in game. Usually a VFX house has its own proprietary rigging mm -hmm. that, that you have to put inside these things. But, yeah, it, it features pretty heavily um, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the process. So, Neil, when you're putting together a proposal for a developer, what do they bring to you at the start? Do they sort of bring you a trailer script and say, this is what we want you to make? Or do they come to you with the game and say, what do you think, how do you think the best way to, to promote this game would be? Yeah, it can be a variety of ways. Sometimes they have a very strong idea of what they want. Um, and, and then I'll work with them to kind of, you know, to, to, uh, to hone that, you know, to shape it into something that, that works more, that, that has the filmmaking language. Usually what you find with developers is they're, they're obviously looking at this through a, through a video game lens, okay? It's their game. They've been working on it for three, four years or whatever it's been. Um, and, and they will fully admit they're not filmmakers. They're, they make games. Um, so, so then it's my job to take that idea or that script and I work with them to shape it into something that, that has a, you know, a beginning and a middle and an end or, however, you know, a structure, whatever, you, whatever that structure may be. Um, sometimes you don't get anything. Sometimes you will literally, they'll, they'll fly you to their HQ, you'll play the game, they'll talk to you about what they feel is important things to communicate I'll be taking lots of notes and then it's my job to come up with a script, you know. Um, sometimes it can come through an agency and an agency has done all this legwork for you and then it's your job to take their scripts and give a creative response to that, you know, with visuals and, you know, words and, and stuff like that. So, so it really does depend. It, it depends on the, on the job. What sort of rules and guidelines did Monolith provide as far as, you know, how far away you could and how true you had to be? 
they the they were really good. They were lovely to work with those guys. Um, obviously, again, you know, they're they're the developer of the game. This is their baby. There's going to be certain compromises that they have to make sometimes. They, you know, and again, you're taking a video game character, like one of their orcs, for example, and then you're making it real. You're making it live action. It's never going to look exactly the same. Like if you take those, some of those video game characters aren't anatomically correct. They're just not, you know, like, they don't need to be. They're in game, you know. But like you take a character, like you put them up against a human face and his eyes are out where <laughs> your actor's ears are, we're going to have to do a little bit of massaging to get that face yeah. Yeah. to work on a real guy, you know. So some of that obviously, you know, for them was not, I wouldn't say it was painful, but for them it was like, they wanted to make it look more like their character. We would always have to try and explain to them that it had to be this way in order for it to work on a practical makeup, et cetera. But look, uh, you know, they, they, they were amazing. They're a real great team to work with. They, they and that, look, they love the end result. That's all I can ever ask for. That's seeing it on a big screen at E3 and, you know, everyone getting giddy about the costumes and the makeup and, they got they got all of the armor and stuff shipped back and and had it on display at E3 and you know it was like it was a big deal for them. I mean, look, usually these big live action trailers are reserved for games like Halo, you know, like the bit like Assassin's Creed. I mean, like these game budgets are a lot bigger than what Monolith had to work with. You know, Shadow of War, even though it's Lord of the Rings, it wasn't. It was. It's. It wasn't seen in the same league as as some of those big, those bigger AAA games. So, so for that, for them, it was a big risk, and a, you know, it was a risk that paid off. Neil, it's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you. Thank you so much for giving us your time, and uh, we wish you all the best with your feature. Thank, thanks for having me. Thank you, Kate. Nice to talk to you. Take care. You too.